Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ on this blustery Sunday morning. I thought blustery was supposed to be for March, but apparently it could be in November too. We're glad to see you all here. There are a number of announcements that I want to mention in, that are in your bulletin. The November 14th is the worship service at the Morning Sun Care Center. Today we do have a congregational meeting, the purpose of which is to receive the budget and to vote on the terms of call for myself. And I encourage you to stay afterwards to be able to do that. I bring up this little sheet again. There are still some in the back, I hope. And even if uh, you have one, if there's somebody in your family that could, that's a member that would like to, or participant that would like to uh, fill this out, you would like them to fill it out, then I appreciate it because we have the opportunity to change the worship service time. And I've had a few, I've had a number that have been sent back thus far um, that have made it to my office. And so you can either leave it here or you can leave it with any session member. But please fill it out so that we can get a good feel for what would work best for this congregation as a whole. Even if you don't care, pick a day or time. That would be good. Are there any other announcements that we need to make? Um, John, I noticed that they've included the uh, mission team going to Pakistan. Yeah. For security purposes, we don't talk about it outside of the church. Okay, yeah. Um, for those of you that are interested in that, that sort of thing, we have a, a school in Poswer, boys school, is that it? Well, um, the denomination. Yeah. But we're sending a mission team there, and we were told by the State Department, don't advertise it on Facebook, don't advertise it outside your church. For safety reasons. They'll right. Talk about it when they come back. Yep. And I'm sure that they will be happy for us to invite them even if we wanted to set aside a special time for it. Any other announcements? Pastor John. Yes. I think that we, on behalf of the congregation, we welcome Mr. and Mrs. Roger Zelzel to the back. And we have wonderful members of So, congratulations. <laughs> yeah. I think this indicates something about your psyche, Roger. I won't be that long. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Roger. Happy birthday. It's a little bit late. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I called her off this year. <laughs> Sorry, do we have any other announcements to make at this time? Then let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship as we listen to the prelude.
Good morning. And thank you. Thank you, Pamela, once again for a wonderful prelude. <clears throat> Those of you who are able, please stand and join me in reading responsibly, responsively, the call to worship. This is from Psalm 91, verses 9 through 16, which is also in your Pew Bibles on page 931. For all those who have paved the way for our freedom of worship, we give thanks, O Lord. For those who have taught us about witness and the power of love, we give thanks, O Lord. For those who work in our church, that we may come to know what it means to serve, we give thanks, O Lord. For all the saints, those who rest from their labors, and those who labor still, we give thanks, O Lord. Praise be to God, who continually inspires and guides workers and witnesses. Open our hearts and spirits, O Lord, and help us to become good workers for you. Let us worship the Lord. Our opening hymn this morning is number 547, For All the Saints. This is the one that's a little tricky, and then you sing verse 1 and the chorus, and go back to verse 2 and the chorus, and then you go over to the next page for verses 3, 4, and 5, and then you go back to the first page for 6 and 7. And if you're all confused as I am, we should have fun. <laughs> Oh 
Well, that should have cleared everyone's pipes pretty well. Our responsive reading today is from the Living Bible, this little brown book you find in the pew, number 96. <coughs> Say there, is anyone thirsty? Come and drink, even if you have no money. Come, take your choice of wine and milk. It's all free. Why spend your money on foodstuffs that don't give you strength? Why pay for groceries that don't do you any good? Listen, and I'll tell you where to get good food that fattens up the soul. Come to me with your ears wide open. Listen, for the life of your soul is at stake. I am ready to make an everlasting covenant with you, to give you all the unfailing mercies and love that I have for King David. He proved my power by conquering foreign nations. You also will command the nations, and they will come running to obey, not because of your own power or virtue, but because I, the Lord your God, have glorified you. Seek the Lord while you can find him. Call upon him now while he is near. Let men cast off their wicked deeds. Let them banish from their minds the very thought of doing wrong. Let them turn to the Lord that he may have mercy upon them, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. This plan of mine is not what you would work out. Neither are my thoughts the same as yours. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours, and my thoughts than yours. As the rain and snow come down from heaven, and stay upon the ground to water the earth, and cause the grain to grow and to produce seed for farmer, and bread for the hungry, so also is my word. I send it out, and it always produces fruit. It shall accomplish all I want it to, and prosper everywhere I send it. You will live in joy and peace. The mountains and hills, the trees of the field, all the world around you will rejoice. Where once were thorns, fir trees will grow. Where briars grew, the myrtle trees will sprout up. This miracle will make the Lord's name very great and be an everlasting sign of God's power and love. We cannot come before God unless we are first honest with ourselves about who we are, about the mistakes we make, and about how well or poorly we care for others. In this spirit, let us confess our sins before God and one another. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Lord of mercy, forgive us when we make excuses for our lack of faith. We let our selfishness and apathy get in the way of illumination and peace. We find ways to duck out of our opportunities for service and witness, claiming that we are too small or too ill-equipped to be effective witnesses to Jesus Christ. How foolish we can be. All of our lives, God has been present to us, whether or not we knew it. God's love is always surrounding us, yet we have not taken the time to recognize it. We whine and complain about the misfortunes that have befallen us and wonder where God is. We want immediate release from our struggles. And when release comes, we again move on in our own realms of self-centeredness. Help us, O oh Lord. Stop us from being so faithless. Open our hearts with your forgiving spirits that we, having been healed and forgiven, may actually be effective witnesses to your love and compassion. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Hear the good news. Here are words you may trust, words that merit full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. To all who confess their sins and resolve to lead a new life, he says, your sins are forgiven. He also says, follow me. Now to the one who rules all worlds, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. My sisters and brothers, know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Thanks be to God. Please join me, if you will, in the prayer for illumination. O oh God, your word is more precious than fine gold and sweeter than pure honey. As we turn to your scripture, send your Holy Spirit to infuse your word with truth and grace so that the good news of your love would shine before our eyes and delight our senses so that we cannot help but respond with wonder, faith, and trust. Amen. Our scripture readings this morning uh, first will be from Isaiah, chapter 55, verses 1 through 13. And you'll find that on pages 1, or 1148 to 49. And our second reading will be from Mark, the first chapter of Mark, verses 35 to 39, which is on page 1553. But before I begin, a short narrative, a pardon, an explanation, if you will. A pardon is an official warrant of remission of penalty. God alone can grant a pardon. All the assur although the assurance of such a pardon may be communicated to men by God's agents. We just did this After following our prayer of confession. I announced assurance of pardon, acting as a pastor. But there are several conditions when a pardon is granted. First of all, the person to whom the pardon is granted is acknowledging guilt of transgression. Second, the guilty transgressor must forsake his, his wickedness. In other words, he must repent of what he has done. Third, the guilty transgressor must turn to God, who alone can grant full pardon. And fourth, God's mercy is available in a pardon when the guilty transgressor repents and turns to God. Isaiah 55, verses 1 through 13. Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me, and eat what is good, and your soul will delight in the richest of fare. Give ear and come to me, hear me, that your soul may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promised to David. 
See, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander of the peoples. Surely you will summon nations you know not, and nations that do not know you will hasten to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has endowed you with splendor. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God, for he will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return to it without watering the earth, and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seeds for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire, and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. You will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song before you, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Instead of the thorn bush will grow the pine tree, and instead of briars the myrtle will grow. This will be for the Lord's renown, for an everlasting sign which will not be destroyed. Our reading from this first chapter of Mark, verses 35 to 39. These are events that took place, according to Mark, just before Jesus and his disciples began what you might call their first preaching tour. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, Let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All yours, John. Done this before. We see in the Gospel of Mark today, in the passage that Karen read, that we don't seem to have a whole lot of action going on. Action is one of those things that Mark loves. He's always putting things in the present tense. As I've noted before, he, always, he likes to use words like immediately more than 50 times in his gospel, which is the shortest of all the gospels. He likes utilizing words that make you feel, hopefully, like you are there in the story. We just had the story about how Jesus had shown his authority in both in the teaching of the scriptures and the authority over the demonic forces and evil over illness and sickness itself as he drove out the fever from Peter's mother-in-law 
And then as he finished up with the crowd and healed many, all who came to him, it said. And we recognized at that time that it was a very large crowd. His practice, his ministry, if you will, was becoming very public. He had something beforehand, but now it is, was, was becoming very public. People from outside of town were coming in to visit him at, in Capernaum when he was there at Simon Peter's house. And we see that they are still around in today's passage. Jesus has done all this work. Now, I get exhausted and need to take a nap in the afternoon just after preaching two services. So, you know, I can't imagine how tired Jesus was. But despite his tiredness, he got up very early in the morning, probably between 4 and 6 a.m. You farmers can relate to that. You people that are first shift can relate to that. For me, if I had to get up at 4 a.m., I'd just as soon stay awake all night. And he went away, it says, to a solitary place. It doesn't tell us where, but he went there to pray. It doesn't tell us what he prayed, though we have some solid guesses about it. But he went there to pray. And Simon and his companions went to look for him. And they must have had some idea. Because, I mean, it's a pretty large space to be searching a town of 3,000 people or so, and outside of town, all around it. Uh, we don't know where, it doesn't mention, but it must have been someplace fairly familiar. And I couldn't help but think, in verse 27, when they find him, they say, everyone is looking for you. Now, not in this gospel, but in one of the other gospels, there was somebody that said that to Jesus. You might remember when he was 12 years old. And they went to Jerusalem for the Passover. And mom and dad and I guess all the other relatives and everybody else were all in a big group. And they took off. And they were actually a full day out when they realized Jesus wasn't there. They did, he wasn't just running with one of the other kids, groups of kids, but he wasn't there. So they go back into Jerusalem and they search all over for him. And they find him in the temple. And they chastise him. Mary does and says, Don't you know that everyone has been looking for you? Where have you been? And he looks at her and he says, I'm in my father's house doing my father's business. And he, the way he says it, it's like, what did you expect? And then it says in Luke that he grew in the spirit and in wisdom. Maybe the wisdom was not to talk back to mom that way, I don't know. Jesus, again, goes somewhere as an adult. And he goes to spend time with the Father. And it's something that in our lives today, with the busyness that we have, that we tend to forget. And I am as guilty or more guilty of it than anyone. And I want to discuss that and the value of devotional time. But first, I have a couple of illustrations I thought were fascinating. Uh, one here says, A pastor had a conversation concerning Sunday morning worship with some of the parish members. Each of them shared his or her favorite part of the service. One said it was the Nicene Creed because that was the moment in which he was able to stand up and declare his faith. Another said it was the music. The songs and hymns deeply moved her. One elderly lady said it was the liturgy. 
She shared it meant so much to her to know that we followed the same worship structure as that of the early church. Another person said it was the prelude. The pastor looked at that person and was somewhat taken aback. The prelude, don't you mean the sermon? Oh, no, pastor, it's definitely the prelude. When asked what made the prelude so meaningful, he said his whole week is always so full, so busy, so intense. But when he enters the sanctuary and the prelude begins, it is the only time all week that he could just sit back, be quiet, and experience the presence of the Lord. And that's really what devotional prayer time is about. It's a time when you sit back, be quiet, and experience the presence of the Lord. You know, even in our prayer lives, busyness infects us, if you will. We have a tendency when praying to ask for things. We bring up our laundry list. Whether, even if it's not for us, even if it's intercessory for other people. We bring up our list of things that we want to ask God for. It's that way in the prayers of the people too, most of it. I freely admit that as well. But devotional time should be something a little different. It really should. When we look at the prayers that Jesus prayed, he didn't just pray and ask God for the Father for things. I mean, he did when in the Garden of Gethsemane when he said, take this cup from me, please. Nevertheless, thy will be done. But he also gave thanks to God multiple times before doing things. And we have an indication in this passage, it's in, implied, but we have an indication that he asked for direction. Because you see, when the disciples found him, he doesn't say, you know, everyone is looking for you. Basically, their question is, where have you been? What are you doing? Instead, he says, let's go somewhere else. To the nearby village. So I can preach there too. Let's leave behind the big crowd. Let's leave behind all the work that I've done here. Because... I'm going over here because I've got something else to do because that's why I came. Another way of thinking of that is that's why the Father sent me. So he must have gained some instruction during that time of prayer and contemplation and communion with the Father. We need to take that time. There was an article in the New York Times several years ago that offered an analysis of what might be called the busy trap. Listen to this excerpt. If you live in America in the 21st century, you've probably had to listen to a lot of people tell you how busy they are. It's become the default response when you ask anyone how they're doing. Busy. So busy. Crazy busy. I like to say I'm running around like a chicken with my head cut off. It's pretty obviously a boast disguised as a complaint. And the stock response is kind of a congratulation. Well, that's a good problem to have or better than the opposite. This article goes on to say, busyness serves as a kind of hedge against emptiness. Obviously, your life cannot possibly be silly or trivial or meaningless if you are so busy, so completely booked, in demand every hour of the day. We're busy because of our own ambition or drive or anxiety. Because we're addicted to busyness and dread what we might have to face in its absence. Being busy might make us feel important or it might hide the feelings of emptiness or low self-worth. I think another symptom of that that is very prevalent today is people fill their space with noise. And again, I've become one of those as well. 
It was something I thought about last night. I was busy, busy, <laughs> studying and finalizing the illustrations and things, and I had something streaming on the computer, TV basically for me, running at the same time. And I really wasn't paying that much attention to it. In fact, a couple times I had to stop and get up and send it back. That's one of the wonderful things about streaming versus TV is I could send it back a couple minutes because I realized that something had been said that I really needed to, to hear. But I was only half listening. I was just filling the space with noise. Why? Because silence is so hard for so many of us to deal with. If you're silent, then you feel alone. If there's silence, then you might have to think about things that you don't necessarily want to think about. And they're not necessarily disasters. It could just be relationships. As it notes here, your self-worth. Stuff, you start to dwell on things that you might not otherwise, that you can put aside. You can set a wall up against it. Because you've got this other stuff you have to deal with. Whether it be busyness or noise. But you know, that does nothing to enhance our relationship with God. Even when we're busy doing the Lord's work. Now, Jesus recognizes that. He had a very, very busy day. He took the time, however, after that busy day, to be alone and in silence. Solitude. By the way, being in solitude does not mean being lonely. You can be alone without being lonely. And you can be in the middle of a crowd and be very lonely. But he went somewhere to be apart, alone. And he did it to spend time with the Father. The same one that we call by his command, Abba. Daddy. It was a different kind of prayer. It was the kind of prayer where we don't hear ourselves, our own voice, which we all love. It helps us focus. I, again, I'm a very verbal person. I was at Credo a couple weeks back, and they always had time for personal reflection after seminars and such. And it was very difficult for me because they assume that you're going to spend time in personal reflection, quiet and thinking. And, and I'm somebody who processes verbally. I do best when I have somebody, even if they don't say much, that I can talk to and bounce my ideas off of. That as I verbalize them, as I verbalize my understanding, and I get some kind of indication of a response, even if it's a, uh-huh, okay, yeah. You men, you, you know, you've, husbands, you've done that with your wives all the time, right? It helps me. So this personal reflection time, everybody went, and they all disappeared. And I'm like, I guess I talked to myself. Me, myself, and I. My dad used to say, as long as I didn't uh, lose an argument with myself, I was okay. But instead of talking to God, maybe we need to take the time to focus on God, tune into God, open our hearts to what He wants to say to us, listening, and taking that challenge in praying. He spent time alone with the Father. And it had a very important effect. First of all, it recharged him. It's easy to say, well, you know, he was God, so he has the power of God, but he was also human. And he got tired. And we see lots of examples of Jesus getting tired. 
We'll see a, one of my favorite stories in Mark chapter 4 when he is sleeping in a boat and he's sleeping through the middle of a terrible storm. And he wasn't in a cabin. This is not the Queen Mary 2. This is a 22-foot sloop fishing boat. And he's in the stern. Now, I don't know about you, but I really, having camped before and having had problems even with a tent when it's raining, not being able to sleep, I don't know that I've been able to sleep through that. But that's how tired he was. He needed to recharge. He had spent a lot of power that day healing the sick, casting out demons. He needed to spend that time recharging with the Spirit and with the Father. He needed to be refocused. It could have been very easy for him to stay where he was. I mean, everybody was coming to him. You know? And it could have just been like one of those faith healers. Had everybody come, stand in line, pop them on the head, say be healed. Been famous. Probably made lots of money. But God the Father had a design. And his time in devotional prayer refocused him on what was next. Note he didn't dwell on the past in his devotional time. There is a time for that. It's called the examine. But rather he dwelt, in this case, on what comes next. And the father told him, you need to go over here. You need to go over here. It helps us, if we have devotional time, to set a priority. What's important in our lives? There's a huge risk of us ending up with our lives being run by others unless we actively resist. As Christians, we so often feel we're expected to be nice to others, to please others unselfishly, to give others what they ask from us, and even more, that we don't allow ourselves the time to recharge and the time to be focused on our own call. We need to set boundaries. And some of those boundaries are how we spend our time. Yes, we want to live an unselfish life. And certainly that is what Jesus expects from his followers. But we want to know when it comes to the question that is a no and O. Oh, when it comes to the question of who sets the agenda for our lives. It's not the crowds. It's not even those close to us, the disciples of Jesus in this case. Goodness knows there are times when they tried to tell him what to do. We should go here. We should not go there. Sorry, that's where I'm going. Prayer comes in at that time. God has a purpose for our lives, your life and mine, for each one of us. Our lives will not be fulfilling unless we constantly move towards that purpose and that goal. We may not know what that goal is in its entirety. We may ask God in prayer to show us that purpose. and still not get a clear answer, but that need not discourage us. God's word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And the word that's used there is a lamp, the kind of a lamp that a night watchman used. It only shows the next step or two. It's not a spotlight. It's not your high beams, which I was using last night because of deer. I read a meme the other day, this is an aside, but I read a meme the other day that said, it was on Facebook, and it said, uh, look out for deer on the way home. And then underneath it, it said, the Midwesterner's way of saying, I love you. God's word, his call frequently only gives us the next step or two. And in a way, that's great because it requires us to constantly be in prayer. If we only know the next step or two, then we need to go back again to get the next step or two after that. 
and back again and back again. Every morning, if we can, or every evening, whatever time works best for you. There was a, a man who uh, is mentioned, and now I can't find the illustration here, um, that was a clergyman in the 18th century. And he said, I never talk to anyone without talking to God first. I never do anything with my hands until I've been on my knees. And I never read the newspapers until I've read the Word of God. It puts you in perspective, in the right perspective. It gives you the right perspective. It puts you in the right place so that your priorities are set. That's why most people like the devotional time in the morning. But even if that's not the case for you, you still need to set aside a time for devotion. You need to set a time, aside a time to recharge, to refocus, and to renew your relationship with the Father. When you do that, your life will be empowered. You will be amazed at the opportunities that God gives you. And you'll be amazed at the impact that you make in other people's lives. We can only do so much on our own. And then we break down. But with God, all things are possible. May you take the time to be renewed with God. We have an opportunity today. We're going to partake of communion. And while it's not quite the same as devotional prayer time, it is a time where we are hopefully recharged and renewed in our relationship with God as we remember what Christ did for us and the victory that He won. May it strengthen you so that you can then go out to answer the call God places in your life each and every day. Amen. If you would turn to 226 in your hymnal, Come, everyone who is thirsty, And Pamela is going to play it through once so that we make sure we have the tune.
God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Let us pray together. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, so that we may truly love you and worthily praise your holy name through our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Now come to the Lord's table, all you who love him. Come to the Lord's table, confess your sins. Come to the Lord's table and be at peace, for the Lord is here. God's Spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is indeed right always and everywhere to give thanks to you, the true and living God, through Jesus Christ. You are the source of life for all creation, and you made us in your own image. In your love for us, you sent your Son to be our Savior. He suffered death on the cross for us. You raised him in triumph and exalted him in glory. Through him you send your Holy Spirit upon us and make us your people. We proclaim your glory as together with all the saints of every time and place and all the angels we sing. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God. Holy Almighty One, blessed are you, Jesus Christ. In the power of the Spirit, you created all things, blessed them, and called them good. You called to yourself a people by your incarnation, life, suffering, execution, and resurrection. You gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery, and made us a new covenant with, with us by water and the Spirit. Experiencing God's love and sure of a place as his children, let us now together say the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he blessed it. And then he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this, remembering me. In a like manner after the supper, he took the cup and he poured it, saying, this cup is the new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink of this, do this, remembering me. For as often as you eat the bread and you drink the cup, you proclaim the saving death of your risen Lord until he comes. Amen. Come to the feast.
Blessings of Christ. 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 Body of Christ. Body of Christ broken for you. Cup of salvation. The body of Christ broken for you and the cup of salvation. Together let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you with all our heart for your mercy and grace. Give us now and in the days to come a living hope in you. And as we serve you in the world, help us look and work for that day when at your name every knee shall bow and every tongue confess you are Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. God of love and uncountable blessings, we bring our gifts this day in the sight of our cloud of witnesses, the saints who have guided our lives and watch over the faithful, our faithfulness from heaven's balcony as we strive to live out their hopes and faith in the promise of your kingdom. May we also rededicate ourselves to live so this world better reflects your kingdom and rule. And as the ushers come forward to take the morning offering, meditate on God's blessings that you give joyfully and generously to the work of his church here in Morning Sun.
Please say together with me the unison prayer of dedication. Christ Jesus, you have given of yourself so freely and fully. Help us who have received your grace to give generously in our turn so that we may feel the pleasure of giving as well as the joy of receiving. Amen. Please be seated. We're going to take on this All Saints Day Sunday a moment to remember those members of our church who have passed on this year to glory. Philip Delzell, Robert Moore, and Lois Hamilton. So we're going to have a moment of silence followed by a short prayer and then I'll move directly into the prayers of the people. Lord, we thank you for the lives of those who have gone before, for those who were faithful to your call and their witness in their lives, and who now rest with you in glory. May our memories of them inspire us. May their Witness, strengthen us. And may the assurance of their presence in that great cloud of witnesses watching over us give us confidence as we too seek to share your good news. God, our Creator, Abba, Father, we give you thanks and praise, for you are such an awesome God. Lord, you are almighty and all-knowing. There's nothing you cannot do. There's nothing you cannot know. We think we know it all. We think we have power, but we have no idea of what real power is, what real knowledge is. Humble us, Lord. Make us mindful of you. Lord, may our lives become centered on you. May we not get so busy that we set you aside. May we not fill our lives with noise. But Lord, by your Spirit, may we be strengthened to grapple with the hard issues in our lives. Lord, may we keep our minds and hearts fixed on your love for us, shown to us in the cross with Jesus Christ when he suffered and died for us and then as he was raised again, just because you love us. And in Jesus Christ's new life that we have, being new creatures with him, may our priorities shift and our communion with you grow ever stronger. Lord, we ask you that you would heal those wounds that we all carry, whether they be spiritual, physical, or mental. Lord, make us whole to serve your purposes and to do your will. May we ever be aware of your presence working for us, guiding us, Strengthening us. We pray for strengthening of Bob Buckman on tomorrow's surgery. Guide the hands and the eyes of the doctors. Lord, make his recovery swift and 
complete. And for those whom you have called home, we ask a special measure of your peace upon their families. That peace that passes all understanding and only comes from you. May their grieving be complete but not overwhelming. May the work be complete and may their memories be full of goodness and grace. And Jesus, Prince of Peace, come back soon. Bring your peace to the entire world as every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that you are Lord to the glory of God the Father. And Holy Spirit, rest upon each one of us. Give us wisdom to see your will. Give us courage of heart to step out in faith, to remain focused on you. And give us the perseverance of spirit to complete the tasks you have for us, to go where you have us want us to go, to be willing to sacrifice, to bring about your purpose. And Holy Spirit, be poured out upon this church. Expand its boundaries and ministries. Keep it from evil. May it be a light in the darkness of this world and a beacon of joy and of hope. One that lead others to come to know your love and grace and mercy. Even as we have experienced them ourselves in Jesus Christ. And Lord, may all that we do and all that we say bring you praise and glory. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would stand as you're able and turn with me to hymn number 458, Sweet Hour of Prayer.
and the fellowship of the power of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever. Amen.